thanks for, thanks very much um rose uh, i've just got huge um respect for what you and your group do overall uh towards huge challenge and challenges i mean i'm just um i just have profound respect for you so i may or may not have the knowledge there's a lot of knowledge we don't have with COVID and won't have for years um, but you've certainly got the experience and um, in many ways that's what counts to share so I have a PowerPoint and I may or may not depending on what happens show very much of it <laughs> and but I can make that available because some of it's got more knowledge within it and people can take their time if they're so interested in it and having a look at that after um so i shall go to share screen for a start if i've got the right one there somewhere i think this is up here and see what comes up there if i go to the beginning up to there and slideshow from beginning that should do it can you see that all right yes we can that come up that's just the um start one of course um and as rosa said please rose if i'm off topic or waffling on um if you don't say something my son will i think he's um might be online as well uh so these were the main um uh, it's not rude at all so any questions or interruptions please just direct me uh these were the main questions that were raised and so i'll cover those off first <laughs> um a broad overview of infections and what causes them. I'll go into that a little bit more shortly at this time, but I'll just give a summary now. Most infections we actually catch from a tiny component of our normal, primarily bacteria that are in us or on us. So most infections are urinary infections or infected cuts or wounds. We don't catch them from on the whole from dirt in the lawn and such dirt in the garden. They emerge from a tiny part of our own normal flora. That's what most infections are. They're called endogenous. We catch them from ourselves. Exogenous infections are generally, not only, but generally viruses that we catch from somebody else, like COVID, of course, SARS-CoV-2. And we don't normally have that virus in us or on us. They're called exogenous infections. And that's primarily what we're talking on today is exogenous infections um because they've they can really cripple people the after effects of what they do and their lives adverse consequences of infection you of all people will know what that is um you uh, to be part of your group will have been substantially adversely affected for an ongoing period of time whether it's from covid most of these um myalgic encephalitis chronic fatigue me cfs most come from an infection generally a viral infection a consequence delayed consequence from our immune system um which somehow doesn't um doesn't remove them or doesn't deal to them um uh what we would say how we would like them to or appropriately and we don't know the reasons for that um someone may well say but i never had an infection i just developed chronic fatigue that's another key point is if we breathe in something like covid virus or influenza we don't automatically get infection if we get few enough of them our immune system will neutralize them and get rid of them before we get an infection. So we may not know we've had an infection and that's called subclinical or underclinical um, infection. So we can have infections and they can be neutralized by our immune system and we never know we've had it. But we can get a consequence from it, which can be uh, ME, myalgic and um, Givlitis or long COVID or chronic fatigue. What's happening with the COVID variants? Um, all we know is they uh, there's several hundred of them around the world now, uh, literally hundreds of them, and they keep on. Uh, from their point of view, they from the virus's point of view, and I'm not suggesting it's got a brain, but from the virus's point of view, it keeps randomly breaking up into other parts. 
and reassorting to form new variants. And there's literal, literally several hundred of them around the world now. The variant or the strain that can evade our immune system the best will always be the one that predominates around the world or, or equally importantly in our region or equally importantly in any particular individual person. So most people will have caught, because it's so, so infectious now, the latest strains will have caught COVID, either with symptoms or without. Most people will have caught it now and have some form of residual immunity, even if their antibody levels were no longer detectable, they'll have some form of residual immunity. Luckily, the uh, COVID infections the actual infection itself, in general, are getting less and less what we call virulent, less and less uh, harsh disease symptoms on the whole around the world compared to the earlier variants. They're getting less and less virulent all the time. There's nothing um, uh, that's a random event. There's nothing to stop the, the possibility in the future of a more virulent strain coming. But the key thing that favors any of these variants is in terms of numbers is how many people can they infect because the people in that population have either not caught COVID before or the vaccine um, doesn't doesn't work as well and so the good thing as a summary from that the good thing is that all the newer variants coming on and like I said there's hundreds of them the newer variants are becoming less and less virulent, less and less disease forming, and even just a bit of a snuffle or a cold can be an infection with COVID. The perhaps bad thing, and I'll come back on that, is the vaccines are getting relatively not very good at all now. Relatively not very good at all. Um, there is this dilemma facing everybody, really. Should we... We know that when we get bad adverse outcomes, as in long COVID, um, when we get bad adverse outcomes, we want to reduce our chances of getting COVID at all. And so we'll spend some time on that. So the vaccine may not work very well, but if it reduces it at all, that may be helpful. And there's a balance between thinking, well, if it doesn't help at all, there's a very, very remote chance but it does happen of somebody getting an adverse event from the vaccine. But generally, vaccines are not, well, always vaccines are never released into the market unless it's been proven that they work much more effectively than not having the vaccine. So there's that individual balance people have to work through. Um, ben, I've just got one comment. I think a yeah. lot of people in our community um, have isolated well, they are isolated naturally yes. um, because of their health condition, but they have taken great precaution to reduce sure. their exposure to COVID. So, uh, yeah, I want your comment that maybe we've all already had, you know, uh, had a COVID event. Um, sure. mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I wonder. <laughs> That's right. Well, I'm going to put it another way. Yeah. And so you would have to isolate extraordinarily well, and I'm sure many or most of you are, to have no exposure to COVID. And by that, I mean the COVID virus, as for any of the viruses, respiratory viruses, is about the same size as smoke particles, same size as smoke particles. Now, we can't smell them, but they're about as it happens, 0.3 microns, which is 0.3 thousandths of a millimeter, but that doesn't matter. They are about the same size as smoke particles. So if there was to be somebody in your house or a supermarket that you popped into or any other person contact at all, if they were a smoker and you could smell that smoke anywhere in your house, then you are, even if they left an hour ago, <laughs> then you are up for being able to catch infection. And that's why most of the world, no matter what they do, 
it's pretty hard to have no contact with that smoke. It's, mm. it's a tricky one. So especially you're going to be more likely to get it when the waves and the waves of infection will keep coming about once every six months because our immunity, our antibody immunity drops off over the course ongoing over six months from when we had contact with it, with symptoms or without. <laughs> and so then we will expect this coming winter that there'll be another wave of infections not only influenza, which we get um, every winter, uh, and another one called respiratory syncytial virus, RSV, which mainly affects children, but also lots and adults as well, especially the elderly, but COVID. COVID, our immunity will have tailed off by the winter and we'll have another wave. So very, very, very hard to avoid cigarette smoke. And um, I, uh, that's, um, that's the tricky part. Practical steps, isolation, clearly, as you've done. I suppose I'm, I don't know how to answer really. Some people, there's no right answer. Some people, when they catch infection again, uh, with symptoms or without, uh, and or get vaccinated, some people that helps their fatigue after they, after a couple of months, and some people makes it considerably worse. And there's no no knowing which group any individual will fall into. Um, the practical steps to reduce, isolate, especially if somebody's got any symptoms at all. That's people visiting you or you yourselves. Any symptoms at all greatly increases the chances that COVID could be one of those causes. Uh, same as influenza, I might add. Um, Influenza, many people think, ah, that's the run over by the bus syndrome. You feel as though all your muscle aches and everything else and you've got a temperature. Uh, in fact, that's only a relatively the tip of the iceberg of people that have influenza, have those symptoms. Most people with influenza just have a cough and nothing else. In fact, most people with influenza have no symptoms at all, about 70%, have no symptoms at all, but they've got the infection, a subclinical infection. Um, so they're the tricky parts. <laughs> um, uh, ben, sorry, um, we have no a problem. question in the chat. Yes. Um, probably related to the pro previous um, session. Uh, That's fine. Topic, but do you think by taking the isolating measures and mask wearing that people with ME may have had very minor loadings as opposed to no contact? Ah, <laughs> really good question. Uh, thank you, Zidane. Uh, re really good question. And Rose for interrupting me on that. That's great. Um, that's a really good question. And the same as boosters, whether to get boosted or not. Uh, nobody can give you a definitive answer. Um, the broadest immunity seems to be if you have um, um, caught infection and or had vaccination, you'll get a reasonable residual immunity, which may actually last for life, the residual immunity. So it's not going to be nearly as good, but residual immunity. If you've been vaccinated and had one booster and caught infection without or with symptoms, that seems to give the broadest immunity we can get. It's not going to stop you catching infection, that's the broadest immunity. So I think the standard formal answer, as medical authorities will say, suggest, especially if you're at higher risk, suggest getting the ongoing boosters once a year, perhaps. But if you have had a booster or a vaccine and had chronic fatigue before, you'd be considerably more worried about it. And there's no right answer. Um, uh, so that would be the ideal. And I'm sure it's what happened to me. I had a vaccination and then a booster in February last year. And then I do a lot of work with the African community. And I was in Auckland. And most of them were not vaccinated, and a number of them had COVID, and I didn't get it. 
So I, when I say I didn't get it, I didn't get it with symptoms. I'm sure I had a number of subclinical infections. So it boosted my immunity. You're quite right. And it boosted my immunity with those subclinical infections. I then, and I'm in a different situation to you, I then decided I would actually be better knowing the risks, especially because of having a family member with um, long COVID. I think I'd be more comfortable catching the infection and now and knowing the risk, but I could get long COVID, but I wanted a broader immunity. And we had six people to dinner after being in the house 10 years after the earthquake. They're all fit and healthy. They're all health related people. The next day, one of them phoned to say, oops, I've, the two of us have come down um, with COVID. We've just done a rat test and it's positive. All six people at that table, um, six that came, all eight people at that table, then came down with COVID over the next three, three to five days. So I hope that covers off, Anne. <laughs> it's, um, none of these things are there are simple questions to. Uh, practical, just get back again if it doesn't, um, practical steps to reduce the risk of infection. Um, so I'm going to give that vaccination or booster as pros and cons <laughs> and leave off at that. Isolation to keep away from people that have it, so long as it doesn't cause you too much psychosocial harm. You have to bear that in mind. If you are totally isolated, we know sociability and or sunlight, I might add. Sociability being outside, sunlight, vitamin D. Um, sociability can definitely help us um, as individuals, um, both our immune system and um, um, just sociability helps us. Um, we have a support network. I know we can do that partially online as well. That's worthwhile. So isolation, socialization issues to think about, um, also to think about boosters or not. If you've had trouble, major trouble with previous ones, then you'd be a lot more cautious still. Then we come, how do we reduce the virus if it's there? How do we reduce the smoke? Um, clearly shared air is what raises our chances of catching it. So if we're outside, um, smokers outside, the air gets hugely diluted of any smoke or virus uh, very, very rapidly. Uh, if you're in a group of people outside and you have the wind behind your back and you're talking to the person in front of you, then the breeze will be blowing it away from you if they had it with or without symptoms. So that can be one way to perhaps mitigate risk. Um, being inside, a lot of the air is rebreathed and not diluted. Opening the window and or doors to outside will uh, change the air in the room about once per hour. But if I'm breathing out without symptoms, about a thousand virus per, per cubic meter is a thousand virus. And if you only need to breathe in um, perhaps um, 10 or 50 virus to catch the infection, then that gives us a problem. <laughs> it's too much there. Does that make sense? All right. Um, uh, yes. Going care might mean at least keeping virus loadings to a minimum. Yep, that's a good idea. So the virus loadings, thanks, Anne, the virus loadings to a minimum is the really key feature. So ventilation is really, really key. And there's two ways of keeping the virus to a minimum. One's ventilation and or filtration by air purifiers. And the other is masks. The better quality, uh, the better. So an N95 mask is the best. But if I just go through the numbers, and I'm sorry to be slightly technical on this, if there's a thousand virus per cubic meter from somebody that uh, has infection with or without symptoms, if there's a thousand per cubic meter, and you only need to breathe in 10 to 50 virus, then an air purifier, well, I'll start with a mask, an N95 mask, 
we'll filter out, if it's worn properly, we'll filter out 95% of the virus um, that you're breathing in, which is really, really good. But 95% of a thousand, if it's a thousand cubic meter, is not enough to stop you getting infection. It will reduce your chances, <laughs> but not enough to stop you getting infection. It will reduce. An air purifier, depending on the type you have and or how effective it is, that may reduce the load in the room. It may filter, if it's got a HEPA filter, what's called a HEPA filter, high efficiency particulate air, that filters all the virus in the room like 99.97% totally, but only, say, four times an hour. So if I'm breathing out virus, <laughs> it'll reduce that whole loading four times an hour. But if I'm still breathing virus, it'll reduce that number enough. And that may be enough then for the N95 mask to reduce it down even more to prevent you getting infection. So I think the combination, if you're really wanting to, the combination will be both of those, an air purifier, but there's a lot of things to be aware of with air purifiers, um, and be careful of the marketing psychobabble that goes with it. Um, so UV lights and all this sort of thing, there's no benefit at all. You just want something that, that filters the air really well. So that air ventilation, open windows, doors, you may not be able to do it in the, win in the winter. Uh, N95 mask in the ideal world, I'll just come back on that. Uh, surgical masks will reduce about 80%, eight tenths of the virus. In 95 mask, 95%. So it's just a numbers game, unfortunately. And the air purifier will ongoing reduce the background loading. Just coming back to the N95 mask, the respiratory viruses, both influenza and COVID virus, they're actually really quite fragile. So they tend not to live in, on surfaces in high enough numbers to cause infection for very long, maybe an hour or two, and then they're gone. But we tend to play a bit safer and say a day. Why I'm saying that is if you've got an N95 mask or two or three, then if it's not used for a, a day or two, I'd have no trouble putting it back on again. It'll work just as well. So the cost with N95s can be hugely mitigated by having half a dozen of them and just having having or less and just having them on a slow slow cycle and use them on and on and on and on. Keep, keep using them because the virus will die in the in the mask. Any questions related to that? Is that clear enough, or have I not? Oh, helped? that was great. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Um, so that's right. That's that would be my summary, really. Um, now, if you do catch infection, remember, and it's important here. I don't. There's, and I've got some on the slides, whether we get to them or not, on immunocompromised people who are actually in a. It's hard to know what's meant by immunocompromised. Arguably. The people with um, uh, fatigue, long COVID, ME, their immune systems are perhaps working too well. Uh, you could say, well, that's compromised because it is working too well. So there's a couple of ways of looking at it. But it's different generally compared to somebody who's had an organ transplant and their immune system is being suppressed. Uh, that, that's a different type of situation. What normally happens with COVID infection, we breathe enough virus in, more than a critical amount, to give us, if we breathe in few enough, our immune system will attack it and get rid of it so we don't get symptoms. If we breathe more, uh, then we will get symptoms and our immune system will come to the rescue. So our immune system will neutralize that virus and get rid of it. But in general, a small percentage of people, and so that's the same as influenza, will neutralize the virus and get rid of it. With COVID, a small number of people having got rid of or almost got rid of the virus, they then have something else happens which does not happen with influenza. 
their immune system suddenly goes into top gear, hyperactive, and there's a marked inflammatory response. And they are the people that get hospitalized. So it was caused by the infection. Then they get it. Everything looks as though they're getting better, better. Then suddenly, wham, they have a, a second clinical really adverse event and they end up in hospital. So it was uh, the virus that initiated it. The body got rid of the virus or most of it. And then our immune response, the inflammatory response is what causes all the trouble, which is why incidentally earlier on, typically with a viral pneumonia, um, if somebody's having trouble breathing, you put a tube down, intubation in hospital, help them breathe. And it was found that lots of people were dying <laughs> around the world. And because when they put the tube down, that makes the inflammatory response for SARS even worse. <laughs> it aggravates, even though the virus is gone, but our inflammatory response that made it even worse. And that is why most infections, if you have influenza, you'd never give a steroid or dexamethasone because that quietens the immune system down, which works for influenza, but it's the wrong thing to do for, um, uh, for COVID. Um, we, um, I, I, we, they said that right. I'm not sure. We um, we want to suppress the inflammatory response for COVID. So anti-inflammatory happens to work well. But if we did anti-inflammatory for influenza, it may be well be the wrong thing to do. Any questions up until then? So we've got the infection. I suggest people with chronic fatigue that, as far as antivirals go, there's something else. Um, Overseas, primarily in the States, they have a um, um, particular medication with antibodies that can be used, injected into people. That's now no longer used. I don't think we had it here. It doesn't work anymore. But we know that antivirals, one in particular, Paxlovid, P A X L O V I D, um, it's actually got two different antivirus medications within it uh, works remarkably well. About 89% of people, uh, nine-tenths if you like, of people who have COVID infection, if they take the Paxlovid within five days of symptoms, it works remarkably well at, at killing off the virus. Now, there's some catches. Um, the formal MOH requirement uh, Minister of Health requirement is that um, you must be over 65, you must have had a positive uh, RAT test, RAT test, and um, you might, you've got symptoms, of course, and you just have to be mindful of any other medications you're on because the Paxlovid can interact with a number of them. So sometimes uh, depending, you'd have to discuss with your GP or pharmacist, can I go off my other medications to have this? So there's a risk benefit of, of some of these other medications that interacts with quite a lot of them. That works remarkably well. Then there is always discretion for a GP. Um, and there's always discretion. And um, so a GP may think, yes, because of your situation, we may choose to uh, give um, Paxlovid or not if you're under 65. And thank you, Tom. I see he's just said there, he's very scientifically orientated, as those of you that know him. There's also a study testing whether the Paxlovid antiviral helps with long COVID, but we don't know whether it does. So that's also worth noting. Um, it's... Um, uh, my body feels like it's over 65. Um, so thank you, Kerry. Um, that's wonderful. Um, I think many GPs, pharmacists are actually allowed to prescribe it too, and you don't have to turn up. Basically, if you've got the infection, they don't want you going into the pharmacy or into the GP practice. I'll try and do it over the phone. Uh, and um, technically, pharmacists are allowed to prescribe that. So that will neutralize infection. And as has been raised, um, 
uh, that may or may not help long COVID. One of the issues with long COVID, there are a number of theories on it, as I'm sure many of you will be aware. Uh, it's many infections, and I'll just mention these very briefly. It's not just COVID. When people catch Campylobacter bacteria, one in 2,000 people, and there's 15,000 of them caught it in uh, Havelock North uh, a few years, recent few years ago. That's why Christchurch water is being chlorinated now, which there's no need for, but that's another whole issue again. Just in Christchurch, there's no need for. Um, but one in 2,000 people that catch Campylobacter, they get over, no trouble. Then a, a week to a bit longer later, they come down with a chronic neurological syndrome called Guillain Barre. You might end up in an intensive care unit for um, six months. Only one or two percent of people die from it. You generally fully recover, but it was triggered by the Campylobacter. Strep throat. We know a small number of people go on to get rheumatic fever. Um, Salmonella food poisoning, a small number of people going to get reactive arthritis. With COVID, we know a remarkably large number, um, who knows, maybe 5 to 40% go on to get some form of long COVID symptoms. Most of the chronic fatigue, um, brain fog, and many other symptoms you'll be aware of. Um, and most of those resolve over one month to six months, many of them to most of them. Um, but those numbers at one year, um, according, this was an older age group of, um, in, um, was published in the United States last year, September, I think it was, in Nature, it doesn't matter, Nature Journal, is seven out of every hundred people, 7%, of American veterans who had caught COVID went on, had measurable neurological symptoms after or at 12 months. So that's a lot, much harder than Campylobacter or something or anything else. The bad thing of that, like really, really bad, is those of you listening in form part of that group, uh, I suggest mostly or all form part of that group, if there's any upside, if you have a bad um, medical condition, if it's a very common one, then much more research money will go into that. Much, much more research money. And so billions and billions of dollars are going into long COVID and chronic fatigue, uh, ME research, billions and billions and billions. For a number of reasons, perhaps governments are doing it because a significant part of their workforce is being debilitated and can't work and or in some countries uh, paid a wage, including the United States. Uh, we haven't got that far yet in New Zealand, uh, unfortunately, but public pressure is mounting. Um, but also, perhaps you could say um, pharmaceutical companies are more likely to put research in if they can treat all those people with chronic fatigue, long COVID, uh, ME, if they can find a treatment for it, then that is worthwhile them putting money in, even if only for profit reasons, let alone hopefully ethical reasons of what they're doing. Um, and again, thank you, Ben. Have you come across anyone who has reacted adversely to Paxlovid? I've heard of two, they don't have ME. Thanks, Anne. I haven't looked at the specific um, data or not for a long time. Every medication, um, every medication, including vaccines, will have a risk attached to them. There's always a risk. It's just a question of the this term that's often used, risk benefit value, so or ratio. So if one in a thousand has a significant adverse event, I'm not saying that's what it is for packs of it, it'll be a lot higher. If one in a thousand has an adverse reaction, is that better than if a thousand people who are vulnerable because they're over 65 or had an underlying condition um, didn't have it, who a lot more of them will have ended up being hospitalized and um, 
and risk uh, have associated risk of death. Very, very uncomfortable decisions, same as vaccination overall. Um, the difference between them, we tend not to be good at evaluating statistics as humans. I have a favorite saying um, that God created Lotto to punish those that do not understand statistics. And if we did, we would never buy a lotto ticket. We dream that would save all our issues if only we won a million or umpteen millions. Uh, but from a logical, practical point of view, it's throwing money out the window and that's hard to comprehend and understand for us mere mortals. Um, we, we buy the dream. Um, and once again, the um, uh, question was, a, uh, thanks, Ben, I guess, because it's new, it's hard to know whether it's going to be one in a thousand or more, perhaps. It may well be more than one in a thousand, and it may be all of these adverse events tend to be, for instance, um, COVID uh, vaccine itself and one of the slides, if we end up not showing them at all, I'll send you through a word, you can <laughs> wade through them. On the slides, many people, I can't remember, 80% of people have an adverse reaction from vaccine. That might be sore arm. <laughs> and so that's classed as an adverse event. You get smaller and smaller number have, smaller and smaller percentage have a worse and worse adverse event. So generally the, the adverse event, which is the defining one in many ways, is... Um, did it kill the person, uh, packs of it or vaccine? Um, and we know, for instance, with vaccine of COVID, uh, with the Pfizer vaccine, um, I, it's, I can't remember, one in a million. I may well be a little bit higher, get myocarditis and die from the vaccine. And think, oh, why would you get put yourself in harm's way if you knew you could die? Um, of myocarditis and the reason and that's the worst one for the Pfizer vaccine the reason is if you catch COVID then about 20 per million die of myocarditis so that's called the risk benefit um, and it's hard to think and it's tragic if somebody gets a vaccine and die as they do really really tragic but uh, we don't know because they're no longer with us, those people. But if they'd caught, if they hadn't had the vaccine and they'd caught COVID, then their risk would have been 20 times higher. And um, that's, um, that's just that object of harsh reality. I think if um, coming back on that question with the um, uh, drugs, uh, packs of it in particular. If you're ever doing your own research on the internet, I suggest the first word you put in is evidence, and that cuts out a lot of the rubbish. <laughs> so the first word you put in evidence, and then packs of it, and then adverse events, and look for credible credible sites. There will be a number of them, and. Uh, then you may put evidence, packs of it, cost benefit or risk benefit might be better, risk benefit, and say that that's how you do these searches, put evidence first, otherwise you'll get all sorts of um, rubbish. And if it's, an, if it's a university site, .edu, edu, then it's likely to be even better still. Uh, ben, uh, ben yeah. Um, yeah, Anne's just um, uh, added a... Let me see if it's Extra me. Question. Yeah. Drug micro responders, including me, this is my fair over 65 in my case. That is coming back to, thanks very much, Anne, coming back to that question of where, and there may be a number of answers, where does our, those of us that are affected by long COVID, chronic fatigue, ME, um because their immune system or your immune system is perhaps hyperactive and or because it has one tiny wee area of weakness 
I wouldn't call it immunocompromised because we're all immunocompromised <laughs> at a scale. A uh, tiny wee area of weakness, as you say, you're a micro responder or may be a micro responder that makes the evaluation even harder. So if I was to put in, and there's usually no simple answer because um, the evidence is not there, then we have to look at the evidence because the strains keep changing all the time because as soon as we get something or a vaccine or otherwise to help neutralize them, or dare I say it, say we get N95 masks and air purifiers, and so we can, well, so I just make this up, we can reduce the viral numbers down to 10. The strain that can infect people with less than 10 virus will be the one that predominates. <laughs> um, so we're always, in our own way, we're selecting for one that can evade our system. Um, so if I was in your situation, I would put evidence, MECFS, um, Paxlovid adverse events. Um, and or MECFS, Paxlovid risk benefit. And is what I put in and do your reading or if you're having trouble reading, get somebody else. Um, um, uh, then um, get them to, um, if they're a sensible person with science, get them to evaluate that paper for you and give you a short summary. Um, Kerry, yay for evolution. Yes, evolution is what this is all about. <laughs> um, evolution has brought about um, um, and progress. Um, yes, with evolution, as we uh, so-called progress, the human population has grown more and more. We cut down more and more forests and the bats, um, the mosquitoes and such like in the forest, then those species either die out or they have to learn, they have to adapt to, um, to survive their species. And so we get malaria, they adapted by biting us rather than the apes. And we get um, all the other infectious diseases. The bats, when we cut back their environment um, and cut down the forest, we then start selling bats at wet markets in China, for instance, and they'll have the virus in them. And eventually, the more contact we have, a bat may have hundreds of millions of virus in it, just like we have E. coli in our gut. But at some stage, the more contact we have with the bats, one of those strains will come over into humans and cause trouble. And as there's more and more people in the world and traveling more and more, that's how they go, uh, how it spreads. So it's a form of evolution. And yeah, and the more we kick back, um, as with anything, whether it's antibiotics or bacteria or vaccines, those species that cause us harm will always be mutating just naturally. And the ones that happen to be able to get through either our vaccine or antibiotic will be the ones that we're left with. Any more questions or is that enough for you? I can start on my PowerPoint, whichever you wish. <laughs> um, come up, this is bacteria, I won't. Uh, those are endogenous infections, bacteria on the left. Uh, that's where most infections come from. Uh, but some people, uh, so the endogenous ones we have in us or on us all the time. Um, the exogenous ones like influenza, etc., SARS, COVID, herpes. Now, with one of the issues um, with long COVID ME, chronic fatigue, maybe, maybe, and it's like the research is like I always say it's like painting a picture by numbers. There's some fascinating things turning up and distinct biomarkers or chemistry results from lab tests, um, which are starting to be able to prove, for want of a better word, I would say give evidence, because uh, lack of evidence is not lack of effect. But for a long time, people with MECFS were not believed and there was not a test for it. Uh, but perhaps a good thing is they're starting to be primarily in research situations tests that can show actually we can show a chemical reason that's behind some of this uh, or a chemical effect 
we yet have to find the reason. And there are a number of theories. Uh, one of them is, is there a latent virus, as in a herpes virus, or even a COVID virus, that we've almost got rid of it all, but haven't. And that's why um, it'll be interesting seeing the Paxlovid um, research for those on ME that was raised before. Um, and or there are a number of other many, many different pathways being looked at by different researchers. And these are the ones down here, the bacterial ones. Uh, let's put those there. Uh, so each of us, when we think we're clean, we're actually still nine tenths of us in terms of numbers is actually bacteria. We are 90% bacteria, 10% us. That becomes important if we treat, say, the bacterial infection on our finger or thumb, an infected thumb, Staph aureus, you may have heard of, as uh, Staphylococcus aureus. It's emerged from our own skin, so we treat it with an antibiotic. But at the same time as treating that thumb, we treat all the other bacteria, nine-tenths of us at the same time. We can't help it. Where that becomes important, this nine-tenths of our bacteria is part of what's called our innate immunity system, innate immunity system. So if it's never seen that bacteria or that virus or bacteria before, our innate immune system, which works instantly, may work rapidly. So we have acid in our stomach that will kill many bugs. We have um, hairs in our nose. Um, we have neutrophils, etc., in our blood. All of those are part of our innate immune system. So when we take too many medications as a human race, we're getting less and less. Our innate immune system is being compromised. I just mentioned here, only at a research stage only, but some people have shown if we have very cold swims or put in hot chambers, that can boost our innate immune system, which is just interesting along the line. Uh, exogenous infections we catch from somebody else, as I've said. And I've said the analogy for smoke, wherever the smoke goes, the virus goes. Um, so when we have, um, just trying to think, uh, what's it called, Jet Park in Auckland, uh, before we had COVID in New Zealand, there was this barrier put along it, and the public could walk along here, and the newly arrived arrivals went on the other side and straight into Jet Park Hotel. Notice the gap between the barrier here and the top. Um, this is as far as how do we control infection. Once I saw that, I knew then COVID was going to be New Zealand wide. Um, because smoke happens to float over, it doesn't get stopped by the glass <laughs> or the perspex, it just floats over the top. And so the people that decided that was a good idea clearly did not understand Derosad, our own systems, didn't understand uh, that would never work. So wherever the smoke goes, the smoke tends to be diluted by distance, if we're in a room, diluted but not stopped, and outside, of course, um, so lifts will be more concentrated than a stairwell. Um, yes, we can get smoke on our hands. And so washing our hands, we'll take that off. But by far the most common way of passing on infection is shared air. So large droplets, if we're coughing, will tend to fall down sooner. And they'll have lots and lots of virus. But there's always just the vapor. If someone does have infection with or without symptoms, the vapor will spread. We can help dilute it by opening a window or door. But even relatively small numbers further away, the longer we spend at the other side of the room, the more likely we are to breathe enough to cause infection. Um, I think that's important to understand. An N95 mask would stop that, and an air purifier would reduce the numbers in that whole room too. Um, this is just to give an idea of the numbers, a thing called the infectious dose. It seems technical, so I apologize. I could skip it, but apologize. Are there good bugs and bad bugs? Most people would say yes. It's not quite that simple or anywhere near that simple. Old milk. We take freshly delivered liter of milk has lots and lots, even though it's been pasteurized, still has tens of thousands of bacteria in it. They're actually good. When we drink it, they keep our immune system match fit. Um, and our immune system just goes along. Our innate immune system just goes along, neutralizes them. No trouble at all. 
but once the milk gets pretty old, perhaps it's not in the fridge or it's six months old or three months old, once there's over a million per mil of bacteria, then the average person will get ill from it. So you can't say, were they good bugs in the first place? Yes, they boosted my immune system. Are they good at a million per mil? No. Then we come salmonella, we need over a thousand. So the infectious dose or the infectious number is the average person if there is such a thing as over a thousand. Influenza, seasonal influenza is about over 800 virus the average person would have to breathe in. If they're vaccinated, might be 1200, but about 800. Camper back about 500. COVID, when it first started, the Wuhan strain, the average person had to breathe in about 200 virus. So it was a lot more infectious than influenza at a thousand, five times more infectious. Now, each new strain of COVID is infecting people with smaller and smaller numbers of virus. And that's why all the earlier research is not necessarily relevant. The N95 masks do not work as well. The air purifiers do not work as well. <laughs> they reduce risk, but eliminating risk is, is a challenge. Um, opening windows and doors reduces. So I think I've covered this. I'm sorry if it's technical, if you're not used to graphs. Below this red line for any different species will be when we may take the bacterial virus, the microbe in, and our immune system hopefully gets on top of it and gets rid of it before it gets to whatever the level is for that species to get some infection. When it goes over that level, we do get infection. So subclinical or clinical infection when it's above that number. Um, viral numbers estimated, because we can't do research, it would be unethical to say, would you mind volunteering to get different amounts of virus to see if you become ill with COVID? So we have to do it other ways. Estimated viral numbers, for somebody who is infected and coughing frequently, over 7 million virus per cubic meter. <laughs> That's when they're um, coughing. So stopping 95% of that uh, 7.4 million in a supermarket or elsewhere is a trouble. So if they're coughing, we don't want them in the supermarket. <laughs> um, but it doesn't always work that way. Regular breathing of a high shedder or emitter they may or may not have symptoms, produce over a thousand virus per cubic meter. <laughs> over a thousand. That is why it is so unbelievably infectious and um, why it's getting ever, ever harder. The infectious dose is getting lower and lower. Uh, so I think I've covered that. Masks, face shields. Uh, if you've got glasses, that probably works just as well as a face shield because we stop at mask and glasses, it seems that a number of infections, the virus will get in the eye mucosa, and that goes on down into our respiratory tract. So face shields will reduce in a hospital setting, uh, will reduce infections by about 50%, actually, compared to those not wearing them. Um, but uh, glasses may help. Vaccination and boosters, there's all these issues around it, dwindling efficacy, um, but should we still promote or not? In your group, MECFS, that's, I would do a Google search, updated Google search, putting evidence as a first word to see the latest on that. Ventilation and air purification like masks will greatly reduce the numbers. And in the schools, air purifiers can be shown, the study out recently showing about a 70 four percent reduction in um, infections in those classes of warden compared to those that don't as i say even if it purifies the air two times an hour or four times an hour then that's not enough if somebody's breathing there and the infectious dose is very very low isolation of course and time and hand hygiene is important but don't be too paranoid about hand hygiene they die for you. The main thing is do not touch. If your hands are infected with influenza or COVID for that matter, then um, if you had virus on your hands, no trouble at all. But if you had virus on your hands and give your eye a rub <laughs> or pick your nose <laughs> or scratch your teeth, 
then you have introduced the virus to those mucosal surfaces. So the hand hygiene is important, or if I pass you a scone and pass you a scone uh, and I haven't washed my hands, then that's a risk. But just in itself, the virus is not going to go through the skin and it will generally fairly much die out probably over an hour in the environment or low enough numbers not to pass on infection. Um, just a sounds a strange thing to do, but I do it in terms of um, N95 mask. If there's a million people or a million virus, 0.1% is a thousand. <laughs> and if we only need 10 virus to cause infection, um, I say that might be only 0.1% of the population died, that's a thousand people. <laughs> or in, uh, um, in the case of a mask, 5% of a million virus is still 50,000 virus. And that's way more than 10 or 20. So that's why the masks don't work as well as they used to. And air purifiers, that they both work together. But well, um, on, um, so every person now with COVID is essentially a super spreader because, because they've got so much, such low numbers to pass it on. And every person will easily pass it on to many other people. Um, ben, Kiwi's yeah. just asked, um, are schools all supposed to have air purifiers now? I think that's a political hot potato. Uh, and I will just deal, talk a little bit on air purifiers. Ideally, yes, of course. Um, and that have air purifiers, so long as it was a good enough one. Um, air purifiers, are, um, won't have time to look at it at all, but it'll be in what I send through to you. An air purifier itself, they're very, very good if you get one that works well. <laughs> Uh, by that, I mean, we need to know how many air changes per hour, and that depends on the size of the room, how many air changes an hour does that air purifier do? So if it changes the air two times an hour, it'll be once every 30 minutes, four times an hour every 15 minutes. That's good. Is there a HEPA filter? HEPA filters are medical grade. they extraordinarily good, 99.97% of all the uh, virus sized particles and smaller and larger they're uh, filtered out at the same time one i'm going to say it, one of the really well known um air purifiers because of marketing is dyson and you'll see it they look a bit like a a staple and uh, you see this uh, they look quite fashionable lots and lots of marketing and you can see the air when you look through them they've got a face around them now listen very carefully that Dyson one has 10 air changes per hour, major tick. It has a HEPA air purifier, HEPA filter. It's only small on the bottom of the unit. That is seemingly very good. But only just over one tenth of the air goes through the filter. One tenth. In other words, 90% of the air is not filtered. It's dangerous, actually. <laughs> and I think it could be banned from the market. So there is a thing called CADR, Clean Air Delivery Rate, that puts those two together. Few people have ever heard of it. And so they buy, oh, that's really good. 10 air changes per hour, HEPA filter. Sometimes they have a UV light in them and all this sort of thing. And it is a, um, it is a, a dog and dangerous. So if I was being technical, I'd say look up technical spef specifications and the CADR rate and get back to Tom or me if you want more on that or I'll have some of it in the, in the um, uh, later PowerPoint that I send. Uh, just be careful, there is no need at all, I call it bells and whistles for selling, no need at all for a UV light because the filter does them all, uh, nor is there any benefit in fact there's a lot of harm in producing ozone some of them say we do really well we produce ozones to kill the particles in the room we don't want to kill all the particles in the room because it kills all your innate immunity at the same time and um, ozones are very good in the stratosphere they are oxidants we do not want oxidants 
in our breathing air, we want antioxidants. <laughs> and it can cause all oxidants can cause all sorts of respiratory troubles and other issues. And in our food, we want antioxidants, everything else we want. Um, uh, this, the school one, Tom, I had a Google carry. I couldn't see guaranteed air purifiers at school, but government bid to buy a bunch for schools last year. As always, thanks, uh, Tom. Thank you. They've said they would. There's all sorts of reasons. One of them is money um, and the schools, every school classroom having them. One of them is having good enough quality ones. I know they, um, they nowhere near got enough uh, for schools. Another one is um, um, supply chain issues. Uh, suddenly all the schools in the world, all the Western at least, or industrialized world, schools in the world want an air purifier. And if all the rest homes in the world want to purify up every room, it's suddenly there's nowhere near enough in the world. So there's constraints on them. Um, and so with air purifiers, if there's a CO2 monitor, there's no point having a CO2 monitor. That's sort of useful in a school because once it gets over a certain level, so 600 or so, you know that air within that classroom has been um, rebreathed a number of times. That's all it tells you. It doesn't stop the number of particles. So there's no point having that in your air purifier that you're buying. There's also particle counters and all sort of thing. It doesn't help at all to know how many particles, 2.5 or otherwise microns, there are in your room. It's just added. It's put in there to sell the machine. It doesn't filter the air any better. So just be really, really careful. You want something with a good filter and nothing else, basically. Uh, thank you, uh, Kerry. My main risk is my kids bringing it home from school. I agree. Same as influenza, the children are the main spreaders in our community. And not much you can do about it, actually. <laughs> They're the main spreaders in the community. And from there, having gone horizontally in the community, all through the community, because in your community, that's where the schools deal with people from. They go home and then it goes upwards in the case of influenza to the elderly and or in the case of um, uh, others, um, it's um, uh, to those with liable for MECFS, et cetera. Very, very difficult to do anything about it. Um, um, yeah, I, if they, the ultimate is to wear N95 masks for everyone in the school. The, the children have a much lower risk of adverse events from, um, from COVID or influenza, but a much higher spreading rate. And this is an aside, but I'll probably haven't got time, but I'll mention anyway, in um, Japan in the late 1959, they had a really bad influenza outbreak. Many, many people killed by influenza. They immediately implemented uh, vaccines compulsory for all under 16 year olds, influenza vaccines for all people under 16 year olds. Their mortality rate across the whole population dropped dramatically. After 20 years, as so often happens with vaccines, the population said, why on earth do you make vaccines compulsory for children? So it was no longer made compulsory after 20 years, and the death rate then took off up again. Over that same time in the United States, they vaccinated all over 65-year-olds way back in the 1960s uh, because they were the most at-risk people. It didn't make hardly any difference to the mortality at all because the over 65 year olds, um, their immunity is not so good. Anyway, any questions? Well, uh, I... you know, I'm just wondering about time. Um, yes, people no are prob probably uh, getting quite weary now. That's just uh, I because can, I can uh, easily stop there. There's no <laughs> trouble at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, and sometimes it's hard to pull yourself away when. The presentation still going on. Absolutely no time at all. I'm, yeah. uh, originally, you'd said about half an hour, and I've just kept going. But <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, yeah. Has anyone got any final questions? Or something, some area that they want covered in a bit more detail. Um, it sounds um, 
sounds like uh, Ben's going to share this, the detailed slides with us anyway. So there's an, there's an opportunity there to um, dive in a bit deeper. Yeah. Well, Ben, thank you very much for um, the information you've shared. I've learned a lot and um, and found it valuable and will yeah, oh, it'll be an input to my decision making about um, how I've been careful around not catching COVID or believing that I haven't caught COVID anyway. <laughs> yeah. I, I just um, hope, yeah, I, um, please email me or Tom um, mm. anytime. I just, if you wish to know more, um, I hope it's of some, um, it's yeah. just filled in some of the gaps for you. Uh, either yes, email me or Tom with any questions you, you may have, and I certainly will um, send you, may not be this afternoon, but I'll send you tomorrow probably a um, uh, summary of the PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, well, that's terrific. Thank you so yeah. much. Um, someone says, uh, yeah, that didn't feel like an hour. Very interesting and accessible. <laughs> so. An hour and ten, I think it was. <laughs> Tom has volunteered to make a one-page summary, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tom. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Ben. Um, You're welcome. And all of you, my, um, my, um, just keep up the good work and really, really challenging situation. Really, really challenging. And um, I've seen it within our own household. And um, it's um, I've worked in health all my life, and this is one of the bigger challenges uh, and it's facing ever more people um, and you will have your own variations of that challenge but yeah, yeah. all the best anyway mm -hmm. ben, thank you heaps thank you so much you, very, you, very welcome uh, you were able to explain things um in such a useful way and i'm really glad it's recorded so that lots more people can receive it uh, very very welcome uh, i also something once again it was a reference tom gave me um forwarded i'm pretty sure um it's, yes it was one he forwarded on adolescence and it's quite a technical paper it was very good and i'm sure he's probably shared the um link with you in the past or on his um um sunbeam long hauler site but i spent ages to take out some of the medical terms on it and I'll send that through, change it as I'll send you the PDF and a word part of it, change it as you will if you wish, because I think people with school age children that may handle adolescence, there's some really, really good information in there, but it's a bit of reading, but I've tried to take the, the medical technical terms out and replace them where I can. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you anyway, okay. thank you very much, all the best for you, and uh, keep in contact. <laughs> yes, thank you. Good. Bye for now. Bye. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Bye.